Now my job today is to speak uh, on uh, how to sort of you know, set up or generate a referral for patients uh, for liver transplant in uh, those with uh, acute liver failure. And then I am really going to highlight about how these patients are really then actually shifted from a center to a, a different center and what all it needs. So the plan of the talk would be to look at the selection of patients for referral issues during their management at that time, issues during transit, particularly on the hemodynamic monitoring and the ICB monitoring, and how we have been doing the same over the last couple of years. And the talk is primarily based on our own experience of over uh, about 70 odd ALF patients uh, over a period of the uh, last uh, uh, several years. Now, uh, I note that in my talk, actually, uh, I'm the only hepatologist and rest uh, all are surgeons. Uh, it's a really teamwork, uh, the entire exercise of uh, patient identification, shifting and all, and uh, it's a combination of uh, various you know, team members, intensivists, hepatologists, surgeons, and I'm really going to highlight as to what a hepatologist would be look doing in this sort of scenario in uh, an overall way to improve the outcome of these ALF patients. Now, ALF is a multi-system problem and it involves almost every organ of the body. People are very sick. Primarily, it involves the CNS, the respiratory, circulatory, renal, severe coagulation problems, infections, we just heard, and so on. So, I would start by telling that all ALF patients should be kept under high alert. At whatever center they are being treated, the moment you make a diagnosis of acute liver failure, it's a matter of great urgency, and the same should be conveyed to the treating team, the physician treating, the nursing staff, the family, and so on. And what makes the difference of their outcome, that is an early referral to identify those patients who are really going to be sicker and are unlikely to be sort of doing well at the same center. And uh, it is important, I suppose, that all ICUs at various parts of a country on a national basis should be linked to a specialized liver unit, preferably the one which have a backup for liver transplantation. And this sort of a network should be developed on a countrywide basis so that we know that a patient who's in ALF, I don't want to convey to you that uh, all ALF patients need to be shifted. I mean, we were just talking with my friend, Dr. Vadawan, that I think for 30, 40 percent of patients actually may improve simply on medical measures. But it is our job to actually generate an understanding of these patients who are really going to be sick and uh, the referral for those patients should be done at the right time. Now, this is a very common cartoon and we've been seeing again and again in the session that if you actually do a transplant for them too early, then you take their chance of a spontaneous survival away. And if you keep on waiting, 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 then you may end up having a neurological problems, infections, and so on, and the outcome is going to be bad. Now, uh, some of the pointers which say that this patient who's in acute liver failure should be referred to a specialist unit. Now, to my mind, that's uh, like in this, uh, I mean, couple of points which I would highlight. One is an early neurological dysfunction. Any worsening in encephalopathy, a guy who's been in grade one, grade two, goes on to grade three, I think absolutely there's no reason to wait. This patient should certainly be referred to a higher center or a center specializing in a liver transplant setup. Because if we wait, the patient has seizure, he has decelebration, they are clearly late signs and the outcome in these patients are really going to be bad. Patients who have metabolic dysfunctions, have got hypoglycemia, recurrent attacks, they're actually bad. If the INR is rising, one, one should be doing three to six hourly INR in this patient. And if the INR is rising, crossing more than two, they should immediately be referred to another center. The renal dysfunction, hyperpyrexia, clinically sometimes you can actually make out that the liver volume dullness is actually obliterated. Now, those are signs where you actually have to act and you cannot just wait. These are patients who are going to be sicker and sicker. Now, what are the key components of management during referral and shifting of these patients? Well, we have to highlight on the airways, their hemodynamic monitoring, use of uh, crystalloids judiciously, uh, Man identifying and treating their ICP, prevention of sepsis, dyselectolytemia, hypoglycemia, and so on. Now, it is important to observe these patients very closely. Now, I understand that when you talk of referral, we're talking not these patients lying in a, uh, a very specialist care unit. We are talking of these patients lying in a hospital anywhere else in the city where they may not have so much of uh, expertise for managing ALF as you would find in a high-end unit. But one should basically look into their hypoglycemic uh, situation, avoid sedatives in these patients, 
uh, give fluids but not overhydrate them maintain a blood pressure and cp as normal to as possible monitor the renal function we not put avoid giving fresh frozen plasma bit because it masks the renal uh, liver function and one should use ffp only if there is a bleeding episode or you doing some interventions putting a central line or you are going to transport these patients now protection of airways i think is uh, one of the foremost and crucial thing in these patients any patient who's grade 3 plus he should be intubated and uh, put on ventilator support one should avoid hypoxia and aspiration because they are very detrimental in their outcome and uh, one should actually just keep on mild hyperventilation at a center initially when you're just treating them and as you actually sort of you know try and shift them you'll find that you can actually end up having pulmonary edema sepsis bronchospasm chest infections which are absolutely detrimental in these patients look for uh, renal problems acidosis hyperlactatemia hyperkalemia hyponatremia and particularly fluid overload sometimes patients are actually given too much of plasmas which also leads to fluid overload they need a basic cardiac uh, and vasc uh, vascular monitoring i think that is important to have lines at least one central line and if it is possible an arterial line should be there they have a high output low pressure state there may be need of inotropes and uh, a very judicious and cautious uh, assessment of neurological status of these patients is mandatory one should be doing at least a two hourly neuro observation the nurses can do it the doctors can do it avoid uh, unnecessary sedatives analgesia look at the gcs score the pupillary reaction we know that an isocoria is a bad sign but all is not lost even if there is pupillary asymmetry if you act at the, at the right time but most importantly you should be aware of what's happening uh try and identify seizures sometimes you know seizures can be very subtle and you, uh, a, a guy a clinician who's really very uh, uh, careful can pick up those subtle signs and actually act on them uh if there is a doubt grade 3 grade 4 patients particularly if you wanted to shift them from a peripheral center which is you know far off you know a lot takes a lot of uh, money involved uh, you know air ambulance so on then i think it's a good idea to do a plain city head if it is uh, easily uh, possible to be done because it is better to exclude a ic bleed in these patients and also it gives an idea of cerebral edema in these patients now i will actually spend the next couple of slides on practical issues during transit which i am really uh, uh, supposed to be speaking on from now on now uh, there are a lot of logistics involved but i think it is very important to have a system of on site evaluation of these patients who are really going to be a uh, potential candidates for liver transplantation if needed and what do we do when we shift them and also at the same time there should be a discussion if the family has been told that the shifting is because of the fact that the patient may need a transplant and if you are like we are working in a ldld setup then it is uh, uh, it is actually correct to identify a potential donor from the family at the same time because there are situations when you actually have shifted a patient from a center to your center and then you find that there is nobody in the family who has a blood group match donor i think that is not right i mean you should be very clear why you are shifting one is medical measures absolutely fine but if you are shifting to a liver transplant unit and you have a backup for that then you should be aware of the fact that there is a family donor available they are financially they are uh, okay to have a transplant done so whatever is your intention shifting can be either because of medical treatment alone or could be because of liver transplant which you are planning but it should be clearly mentioned to the family the relatives the treating doctors at the peripheral center and accordingly one should act now shifting can be either by road or by air now i would say that uh, the crucial thing is when you shift a patient if the patient is shifted poorly and he comes to you with unequal, unequal pupils decelerating i think it's absolutely useless and disastrous there is a sequence of bed trolley ambulance you know we are not working in a very high end setup like uk or usa we have worked there before we know how beautifully you can just smoothly shift a patient but in our setup i am telling you on a ground reality it is not so you really have those trolleys and ambulances which don't have uh, the wheels working patients are bumped so all these factors are very detrimental and actually the exercise of entire exercise of shifting a patient may prove to be negative if it is not taken care of you can do air shifting either by dedicated air ambulances they are very expensive but now they are available in many centers in the country or you can use the commercial airliners uh, i would say that you know in the initial uh, about 6 7 years we have been using the commercial airliners quite successfully what you do is you remove nine seats in the, uh, in, the in the in the flight and then you put a ambulance there you actually have a backup of the uh, oxygen cylinders 
And that's a way of crude way of doing it, but it works actually, and it is much uh, less expensive compared to a dedicated air ambulance. But those who can afford and in centers where you have a dedicated air ambulance, I think that would be the ideal thing to do. Now, patients when they are being shifted, uh, certainly grade three plus patients should be electively intubated and ventilated, and only then they should be uh, uh, shifted. They should have basic lines in place, an IV access, two accesses, preferably central line should be there, and I think an arterial line should be there at the same time. Fluid resuscitation should be done as needed. Hypotension should be treated with boluses of normal saline, and volume refractory hypotension should be treated with norepinephrine. Now, we need to maintain an adequate uh, cerebral perfusion pressure, which is a uh, difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. So our goal is to have a circulatory support to maintain a MAP of about 70 to 80 and a cerebral perfusion pressure of 60 to 80. Now, if your ICP is increasing, uh, no, if, if it is about 20, 30 or so, and your uh, cerebral pressure uh, perfusion uh, comes down to below 40, so uh, which you can actually actually identify in a, uh, when you're doing an ICP monitoring, I mean, that, uh, that is very detrimental to patients' neurological uh, outcome. So you should have a, m a mental target of maintaining these values that uh, uh, are going to be actually uh, giving a good uh, uh, neurological status to the patient as per perfusion is concerned. And in transit, there would be many factors which aggravate the cerebral pressure, like hyperparaxia, seizures, dyslipidemia, uh, hypervolumia, anemia, interventions, and you know, shift the process of shifting itself. So what do you do? Basic management of ICP should be there while the patients are in transit. The uh, head up 20, 30 degrees still works. Avoid unnecessary stimuli suctioning of these patients. Use penetral boluses as needed. You may use hypertonic saline, but I'm not so comfortable uh, advising a hypertonic saline uh, when the patients are being shifted because often they are not on good infusion pumps. The doctors may not be aware of the detrimental outcome of a hypertonic, hypertonic saline infusion. So my uh, suggestion would be to use mannitol boluses and not saline when you're shifting these patients. And if they are on intubation, then you might as well hyperventilate them a little bit, mild, not over zealous hyperventilation, which is actually again detrimental. Now, uh, prophylactic antibiotics should be given. You should have plasmas ready with you while they are being shifted and use them during interventions, bleeding. I mean, if you are actually uh, uh, sensibly shifting these patients, you can have good outcome. I'll really, you know, to just to bring forth my, my viewpoint from a personal experience, just give a couple of examples of, you know, how the patients are being shifted from various parts of the country and overseas. Now, these are all the patients, you know, being shifted from various parts. You have a lady from, you know, Ahmedabad being shifted. Then we had uh, airlifted from Myanmar, Burma, from Kanpur, Lucknow, you know, from Pune and NDA cadet. Just note that all these are young patients who are actually physically uh, fit, the donors, they were all actually mother or father, mother, father, brother. So this is another thing which probably discussed by my subsequent colleagues as to a transplant uh, uh, situation in a LDLT setup, you have to have a donor, which will be discussed later on, I'm sure. And uh, the person to donate should be absolutely your first degree. Uh, it should be either your mother, father, brother, or sister, so on, not your distant uh, relatives. Now, again, to bring uh, a practical you know, understanding of this uh, entire exercise, for example, this is a patient uh, whom we shifted uh, about, you know, I think 2005 or so uh, from Raipur. Uh, it was a commercial airliner. Patient was shifted from there to Delhi. And uh, within 12 hours, the donor was worked up. Why? Because we knew the donor was going to be his wife because we did the on-site evaluation of the donor itself. We told them that, okay, look at what your blood uh, groupings are. What are your problems? The patient has a G6 pre deficiency, which we knew uh, we were aware of. So all these things were actually there in our mind. And uh, within 24 hours, the patient actually had MNC transplant, and they did very well after that. He's still doing very well. Now, this patient, uh, this actual uh, sort of situation, I'll try to bring forth what happened. Now, when I actually went to see this patient in Raipur, he was in one of the hospitals there, a district hospital. Uh, this uh, patient was actually uh, not intubated at the time. He was actually lying uh, uh, and almost uh, frothy at the oral cavities and almost near to aspiration. And my first impression was that, no, I should go back and not uh, leave this patient at all. Now, I'm not a sort of intensivist, neither am I an anesthetist. But what we do is if, uh, uh, luckily at the time, you know, I had my anesthetist with me who was there with me and we assist the patient. We found that he was neurologically intact. There's nothing wrong. He had his acting pupils. He was fine. His hemorrhoid was stable. 
only thing lacking was his his respiratory status and so we intubated him electively he was in great core coma we put his all the lines in place and a quick neurological evaluation was done this is very important when you actually uh, generate this sort of referral and shifting if somebody from your team is there or if an outsourced person is there please tell them to do an online on-site evaluation of the patient look at the neurological status the and he grade pupils doll side movement they really are very important believe me if they are if all these things are fine the patient is fine but in this patient actually we had a doubt and we did a ncct head then and there before shifting because once you are shifting you are actually spending a whole whole lot of money and everything and if you have any element of doubt in your mind that the guy might have had an ic bleed inside then please don't shift it's quite detrimental so with all these basic stuff we shifted him and he had a good outcome this is a lady a girl uh, from kashmir we shifted on 24th of december and transplanted on the christmas day believe me this was a nightmare we had to go on three occasions because the flight could not land in uh, shrinagar finally on the third trip the jet airlines could land with special permission from the atc who allowed us to uh, do the landing with a limited uh, you know visibility which i don't understand how they do it but this was you know again uh, actual situation shifted with ventilator now i i actually wanted to show you this oxygen cylinder here you might wonder what is big deal about that now believe me in a commercial airliner when this was done you are not allowed to have those big oxygen cylinders they don't allow it because of pressure requirements so you have the small cylinders which actually last for only 30 to 40 minutes so shifting from kashmir to here needs about you know 2 3 hours of you know air flying time because uh, you will have to stop at jammu and then come here so we had a break in jammu we refueled ourselves with oxygen cylinders made sure that we are adequate as far as all these things are concerned and then she was shifted again worked up the uh, mother for the donation and uh, within about 24 hours both were you know i mean uh, successfully uh, operated upon and a good outcome she is doing very well now we have a shifting done for a young guys an nda cadet from pune airlifted luckily without any problem father being a doctor uh, donated straight away then this was one of the earliest patients from ahmedabad who was airlifted and then he she had a good transplant so there are lots of patient who have had this you know uh, high end shifting but the purpose of me showing these uh, photographs was to impress upon you that in a desperate situation mayors are desperate but if you do it in the right way you can actually come out with good outcome of these patients now just uh, dr swain was just telling, uh, telling uh, before my talk that of the patients whom we had done mnc transplant in alf actually it's a very good survival rate 89% at one year and 82% at five years which i think is quite good and to my understanding these figures they may be you know on a very selected group of patients are but are much better than the cadaveric organ figures which i used to see in my uh, time in kings or even in the if you look at the registry in uh, in europe probably then you are not selecting your uh, donors you are probably you know looking at more of marginal livers in a super gen transplant all but i'm not uh, i mean really going to argue that point uh, what i want to emphasize upon you is that if you do uh, uh, select your patients do them right shifting then you can actually have a good outcome so to conclude my talk uh, alf patients should be referred early which is a key in their management they should be referred to specialized units particularly those with a lt backup and i think all icus who are admitting alf patients in the country should be linked to a specialized liver unit which has a backup of liver transplant preferably and proper and safe handling of patients during a transit is i think the most crucial step because if you end up having a shifting and patient coming to you with unequal pupils and dissertation believe me that is pretty pointless so with that i conclude my talk and uh, i would just uh, Uh, with permission of uh, the organizers present this slide to you where i would like to invite you all and welcome you to the first transplant hepatology course which we are organizing at vedanta medicity on 16th and 17th february on the weekend uh, it was a pleasant uh, weather in delhi at the time and you are all welcome and it would be delight to have you all there thank you all very much that is a good talk the house is open for discussion seems uh, you've made everything very very clear uh, <laughs> see uh i uh, see what they do is they actually charge by hours you know uh, they uh, uh, if you ask me on a rough figure like shifting from 
Delhi, Calcutta would be what you know on a air ambulance. Uh, the dedicated ones would be what five lakhs. It's right. around uh, it's around two point five to three lakhs yeah. across India. And if you have to ship from abroad, it's around five to six. Lakhs. No, I'm I I, I wanted to clarify that answer in a different way. If you use a commercial airliner, you can do a shifting within two lakhs easily. If you do a private air ambulances, that cost varies. And if you have an an aircraft which is uh, in uh, stationed at the airport for your patient for some reason for about an hour or so, then the cost escalates. So it has to be very well timed. And as Dr. Manav is rightly telling that cost can vary from three to five lakhs, but and on average, I think that's what the figure I would give. You used to, in some of these people from your institution, go to the uh, center and come with the, bring the patient, is that right? Or well, is that just exceptional cases? Yeah, uh, uh, I'll tell you why, I, I tell you, uh, see, these are all experiences in the initial part of the program. And when we started doing, I know we all came from, you know, kings and all. Then uh, when you're shifting a patient, uh, you know, most of these are even 2004, five things I'm telling you. Then uh, we used to feel comfortable going ourselves, having a look at the patient, what's happening, talk to the family, look at the donor, uh, actually uh, possibility or not, because nobody was actually doing, f uh, you know, uh, freely in the country at the time. At the time, out of excitement, or you can say sheer energy, you know, I would go at times myself. But I don't think it is needed for any of our, uh, you know, hepatologist members to go there. Any s person who's stationed there is good enough to look into that. And of course, you need to have your, you know, team of, you know, dedicated, you know, guys who are doctors and all in Emily, they should go. There's no need for, you know, me to go. That's absolutely right. Dr. Gupta, please. Yeah, uh, this was a young guy of about uh, early 40s, had uh, hepatitis E induced acute liver failure uh, and uh, was in uh, grade three uh, and uh, grade three hepatic encephalopathy, his INR was about five and uh, was given the choice of uh, getting transferred by air ambulance, but because of the cost and they didn't know how to go around arranging all that. So rather than wasting time, they just, uh, uh, this is I saw the patient in some other ICU and without uh, Talking to anybody, they just put the patient into the ICU on wheels and then they started going to the uh, Delhi Apollo. And on their way, they kept on refueling oxygen, petrol, everything. And somehow the patient remained well uh, preserved and then Dr. Gupta's team did good job and patient is back in Ahmedabad now. Um, that's very interesting. I mean, I mean, that, those, that must be an exceptional thing. Uh, uh, see, I uh, also uh, agree that in our Indian setup, you cannot uh, ignore the road transfer. We had a you know medical student from uh, Amritsar shifted to um, Delhi on road actually ambulance, and he had transferred. He did well, but I also have encountered many patients that who have been put on ambulance and the jerks and all in our setup. When the patient they come to us, they're absolutely you know in a bad shape. So that is a practical thing which uh, we all agree. Uh, Dr. Segal, what would be your thought on the uh, ICP changes when the patient is in transit anywhere? Uh, you see, uh, I, I uh, also thought about this, but uh, what I understood that if you are in a pressurized aircraft, then there's nothing uh, different. It's absolutely the same. There's a problem when you're actually uh, going up. Ascent and descent. Ascent and, and descent. There is a Those are the only two times the problem takes place. Turbulence. Yeah, and turbulence, turbulence is different, yeah. Other thing which also one must understand is that, which I've myself experienced that sometimes you're in a small, uh, these, uh, the runbacks used to fly there, you know, ran air, you know, crafts. Those were, you know, four seaters. You can't even stand up, you have to be you know, bent all the time. And in those aircrafts, I don't think they are well pressurized and well maintained. And you just have to be there stooping yourself and there's a co-pilot looking at chart and telling you where to go. So that's actually the thing, you know. So, and they don't go to 36,000 feet. All these crafts are 36 to 40,000 feet. They fly between 16 to 20,000 feet. So they, because they are at a low level height, they are not so well pressurized. They are actually, you know, these problems will come. So actually traveling by road may circumvent these kind of problems if you're using a lower quality air aircraft or something. It's just a thought. Uh, that's a great talk. Uh, can we invite uh, the next speaker, please? Thank you very much.